Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Christy Jones, who is in St. Louis, Missouri. How are you doing, Christy? I am good. Partly cloudy here today, John. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of clouds out this way too. So <laughs> maybe you sent them our way. And Christy's the author of Selling Your Way In. And she's a speaker, coach, and sales process consultant. Companies hire Christy to elevate their sales organization because most sales leaders and professionals are discouraged and frustrated about anemic pipelines, aren't they? Just low close rates and missed targets. Um, willing, should Christy willing to get her hands dirty, take no prisoners when helping companies drive revenue from their sales and customer success teams. She's passionate about coaching sales teams to leverage their superpowers to reach their full potential. And uh, she wants to help them to identify and embody the practices and characteristics of top 10% achievers. That's what we're going to talk about today is awesome. The importance of sales professionals being intentional and proactive about their career to take the right job at the right time. And and then we'll also get into a little bit into how somebody is a top 10. Uh, but tell me, start off, like Christy, um, why do you think it is, um, or talk to me a little bit about the intentional and proactive piece? Because just like any job, I think sometimes sales people let their career happen to them. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing is just that. And I think, first off, I think, unlike some other professions, there are a lot of accidental sales professionals out there, people who never intended to be in sales or didn't think they would ever go into sales. So I think that's kind of thing one is, I don't think a lot of people made the intentional decision that sales was going to be the career for them. So I think we're starting off kind of behind the eight ball, if you will. And then from there, I don't think we're treating our careers like we treat outbound prospecting for our prospects. So, you know, we would develop an ICP and we would understand our personas. We would understand the business problems that we saw. We would understand the problems that they have in order to find fit. But I don't think we're doing the same thing with our careers. We're not developing an, an ideal uh, company profile. We're not, you know, really lying out and formalizing and documenting what kind of leader we think that we would work best with or that we need in order to be a coach and mentor, leader and manager. And then I don't know that we really understand our own sales superpowers, as you mentioned. So, you know, I say that there are really five components to, to managing and proactively and intentionally doing your career. One is understanding, you know, like what are your sales superpowers and secret weapons? What are you doing better than your competition and your coworkers? And then matching those with the right company in the mm -hmm. right industry, selling the right product or service in the right market to align with the company, the, the leader, and then the job role itself. And I think those are a lot of components that people are not spending time thinking yeah. about. No, I, 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 would ag I would agree with you. And I think one of the things is that uh, oftentimes you'll have people who are really good at what they do, but they're you know what you would call unconsciously competent. Like they don't know why they're good at what they do. If you ask them, they, they couldn't tell you. That's why oftentimes, unfortunately, some sales managers and stuff flame out because they, they don't know how to teach their salespeople. They just go, well, just do what I used to do. And, I, uh, and they were like, well, what did you used to do? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, which I believe is the reason why too many individual contributors are being promoted to sales management and sales leadership mm -hmm. without providing any of that. So I agree with you. Unconsciously competent. I love that. There are a lot of top 10 percenters and high achievers who don't really know what they're doing. And I do believe there's some natural gifts there. But I believe if you take, again, if those individuals even took the time to sit down and really understand their sales superpowers and their secret weapons and what they're doing better than others and why, um, I, I think that, that they would be a little bit closer to that, but I, I think one of the biggest frustrations I have is individual contributors being promoted to leadership and management without any competencies around those, that that's a completely different skill set. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it's a, I don't talk about it very often, but I'm not ashamed to talk about the fact that I actually have never been an individual contributor in a sales arena. And so I came in straight out of college into a retail management role. And then my very first SaaS job was as a SaaS sales leader. Mm -hmm. So I had been given extensive training around leadership and management and coaching. And I have never made my living as an individual contributor off of a base plus commission variable compensation structure, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, as a leader, yes, but not in the, not in the way that an individual contributor um, does that on a day in and day out basis. And 
I think a lot of people thought that put me at a disadvantage and I actually felt the opposite way. I felt right. like that put me in an advantage because I had been appropriately and properly trained as a leader, manager, coach, and mentor. Um, and then I just had to learn the, you know, the industry, the product, the company. So mm -hmm. I, I think there are just not enough um, professional leaders out there is that's what I consider myself. I'm a professional leader. Yeah, and I think that's a really, I think that's a really, really great point because, as you said, I mean, unfortunately, we just tend to promote people uh, because they're good at what they do. And part of it is that is that we're very unimaginative, right? We we seem to have only one career path. Everybody, see, it's like whenever you inter, you you talk to somebody who's starting out in their career, what what is the next step they want to? Well, I want to like be a team leader, or I want to do this. I want to manage people because we have established that that is the only real mark of progression and success. So when you have top salespeople who may be the greatest salespeople ever, but they're never going to be good managers, you've got to find a way of keeping them uh, motivated and focused without putting them into a sales manager job, and like a year and a half later, they're gone. Yeah, I think it's just it's a lack of self awareness too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you, and I'm gonna put some of the onus back on the individual, right? Mm -hmm. And again, like this is self awareness around knowing yourself. Um, again, a good individual contributor will out earn his or her leader, yep. and so there's plenty of money to be made there, and there are lots of opportunities to be a subject matter expert, to be a podcast guest, to write mm -hmm. a book, to write content, you know, on social that is that people are following. I mean, I think Morgan, I like to look at Morgan Ingram as an example of that, right? Um, you know, took his individual contributorship and took it to a level that nobody expected without going down the leadership path per se. Um, and so I think there are lots of opportunities. I think the other thing is we're not talking about a lot of those. The other thing, you know, kind of going back to like what what what's going to get you to the top 10 percent and putting yourself in the right role with the right company, selling the right thing in the right industry. I think the other thing is we're not mentoring enough, you know, as a, as a profession. And so there's so many, I mean, I think the thing that people don't understand is there's so many sales roles out there. There's roles for hunters and farmers and gatherers. There's a hundred percent commission jobs. There's a hundred percent base jobs. There's so many jobs under the sales umbrellas and different, you know, in B2B versus B2C. Um, you know, there's so many different opportunities out there. And unfortunately, everybody thinks the entry point is SDR. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, now that we're starting to, there are some universities popping up with sales majors, but I've been frustrated after spending some time talking to some of those sales professors at some of those universities that they're basically teaching the SDR job, which means that those people who are not hunters who want to go, you know, there's no entry level for CSM. There's right. no entry level for, you know, um, solution consultant, sales engineer. There's no entry level for onboarding or implementation, you know, manager or coordinator. So, I think we also, as a profession, we we have failed some people. We need to do a better job. There need to be entry level points for all of those type of sales positions in a B two B world. Um, just like you know, somebody mentioned the other day, I was talking to somebody and they said, "Well, we need like an apprenticeship program." Mm -hmm. Like you know, and I was like, "Yes, we need like an apprenticeship program." And so I think we, as an industry, I think this is going to catch up to us. I'm I'm throwing the doomsday towel out there, if you will, in saying, and it was just what you said. We are not teaching, we are leaning into the science of sales in a ridiculous way mm -hmm. with automation, AI, you know, machine learning, bots, and the art of sales is going to be extinct. And one of the reasons is what you'd mentioned earlier, which is we're promoting people who don't know how to, who haven't been taught the art of sales. Mm -hmm. And so how do we expect them to turn around and teach another, the next generation of sales professionals, the art of selling when they don't understand it themselves? Yeah, and and I think and I think on top of that too, uh, on top of that too, Christy is is the fact that as the technology, uh, you know, as AI and all the technologies, uh, you know, can can help to remove a lot of the rote and routine tasks. Actually, the the art of selling, the skill set, I think actually elevates because now you have more time to focus on on the selling, the relationship part, all of that. So I think that's where you're going to distinguish the the, the 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 top people from the rest are the ones who say, okay, I don't have to do any of this stuff anymore. Now right. I can focus on this. Yeah, we just got to make sure that they've been appropriately trained. And I don't know that that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. That's my big concern. And um, and the and then the other part too, as you mentioned, there is is there are so many different roles in sales, and I think that's I think that's a brilliant point there that I think I just wanted to emphasize for people because yeah, oftentimes like people think that you know sales is this one job you're out there you you've got a product or service and you're selling, but you could be on the sales operation side, you could be on the technology side, you could be 
selling lots of you know there's lots of different things you know that you could be selling but i i th i don't think we have done a good enough job of like all uh, communicating what the different types of sales jobs are no i don't either and i think there's certain jobs that are definitely getting more attention than others and that's you know and again a lot of people you know come out of school going into insurance as an example mm -hmm. And right. that's because the insurance companies have been marketing their jobs right better than better than some other some other industries and some other types of positions and so you know i wrote the book selling your way in to help people that very first section is called you have to know yourself before you can get to know the prospect mm -hmm. and it's just that right i want people i think the reason why people are either failing or dropping out of sales entirely or struggling to get to the top 10 percent is a lot of the reasons is they put themselves in the wrong sales role unknowingly right they, nobody guided them. Nobody helped them. They, you know, they ran across a job that either, you know, I say like either, um, you know, Uncle Bob at the Thanksgiving table was like, what are you going to do? And you should go into sales and here's what you should do, you know, or a recruiter calls and says, boy, do I got a deal for you? And I'm like, that's not we like, I, I mean, I interview candidates all the time. It's 40% it's of my business is helping companies, founders and sales leaders hire mm -hmm. the right people. And so I do this all the time. And when I ask people, how did you find that last job? Inevitably, it's one of two answers. A recruiter called me or a buddy of mine who'd left this company, the company we'd worked with, together with to another company told me I needed to come over and, and the grass is greener over here. Mm -hmm. um, and those are not proactive career steps. Yeah. Neither. And I th and I think what you what you mentioned there about the self awareness I think that's that is the most important thing and it's it's the toughest thing for for people and especially nowadays because we spend uh, so much time being distracted by devices and everything that's going you know because I'm always saying like people go oh, I'm the busiest I've ever been and I'm like no you're not you're just more distracted than you've ever been. <laughs> Uh, be honest right. yeah honest. be honest, honest. If somebody yeah. if somebody stood over your shoulder and did a time in motion an old-fashioned time in motion study how much time would they find that you're investing in in non-core things um but i think you're you're 100 right is like people need to take the time out to say you know what am i okay what do i want to do but what am i good at because yeah i've had that experience with people in the past when running organizations when people come into you and they say you know, I, I want to be this, and you're looking at them and going, "It's never going to work for you, right?" That's <laughs> not who you are, but they're so convinced, and it's a hard yep. thing to do when people lack that self awareness. That's right. Yeah, I call it my mommy speech. Um, you mm -hmm. can call it your, you can call it something else. But <laughs> yeah, when they come in, I'm like, I give my mommy speech because I'm like, I, I can just like you. It's very easy for me after having hired and managed um, sales professionals for 24 years very easy for me to take a look at what they should be doing versus what they think they want to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, like, and they're going to leave, you know, I think the average sales professional and no matter what role in, you know, specifically in the SaaS B2B space may be leaving between two and $5 million of lifetime income on the table by taking wrong jobs with wrong mm -hmm. in wrong roles, with wrong companies, selling the wrong thing to the wrong industry. Yeah. And I just think what you said at the beginning, though, I, I think that is so profound. And I, I hope people take that advice is actually is looking at your career like you would look at a customer or a prospect. I think that's really profound because I do think, as I said, a lot of people, you know, sleepwalk their way through through their through their career. And uh, and because, number one, they never take the time out to say, you know, what ideally would I like to do, but also what is even the purpose of what I'm doing now? I think that's always a good one as well to think, why am I doing what I'm doing now? And and in what way does it serve me or not serve me? Yeah, I mean, I call it um, step changes. And so as you're moving up the career path, but not because the that not because that's the career path that your company set for you, right? Like we were, we're always looking for the company to tell us what the career path yeah. is, which again, makes no sense to me. Like, mm -hmm. why aren't we determining our own career path and then finding companies that match that next step that next right step. And, you know, and what is like, you know, do you have it written down? Like I would leave this company if this is like, this is the next step change for me. This is what that next role looks like. If this company doesn't have that opportunity for me by X period of time, when I think I've reached, you know, achieved the, the, the milestones that I need to, well, then I need to go find that company. I mean, I, again, I have yet to have somebody reach out to me and say, I've researched the company here are my qualifications. Here's what I think your problems are and what you need. And I'd like an interview. Yeah, um, I'll tell you, it, <laughs> if, if that happened, I think you'd probably hire the person on the spot. But I would uh, probably hire them on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, but it, it it is it is really it is really fascinating. Um, it is really fascinating how sometimes we just, as I said, we just sleepwalk our way through things and and not really understanding. I mean, I think part of it is not understanding our core strengths because, like you said, I mean, even in sales, there's multiple different types of sales. Like you know, maybe you would be suited to at a company that are fantastic farmers and they love people who yeah. develop great deep relationships who spread into things, and that's what you love to do. But right now you're at another co a company where it's just like, get me go, kill, 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 hunt, kill, hunt, kill, right? Yep. And and you haven't you haven't actually thought about, hang on, this isn't the type of sales for me. That's right. Yeah, and again, you can make plenty of money as a farmer. There's mm -hmm. you know there's plenty of money to be made out there as a farmer. Um, and and there's just so many there's just so many jobs. I mean, you know, I could probably sit here and list forty different kinds of sales jobs just within the B two B SaaS space alone. Um, and like you said, you know, operations enablement, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of jobs that are under the sales umbrella that if you found your passion and your sales superpower and you wielded those together when the right situation, like a, you would be so happy and you would, then it would be so successful. Um, and it could be game changing for you and your, and your family and your life. No, ab absolutely. And, and the other thing you mentioned there is something I just want to pick up on as well, because it's, uh, it's something that I, I often mention as well, is that the idea of investing in yourself. And I think that's a really important thing. Yes, because I think too many people sit around and go, wait for the company to train them, wait for the company to invest in them, you know, sit there going, well, well nobody's paying any attention to me. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you're the only person who cares the most about you is you, right? right. Um, but what I often see with people is I often ask them and say, is um, what's your hobby? And if they say like, oh, I play golf or nowadays it's pickleball or whatever. And <laughs> and uh, and you say, oh, yeah, yeah. And do you ever get do you ever like get coaching or, you know, and, and of course, yeah, they say, oh, yeah, you know, I go to this golf coach. I go to this blah, blah, blah. And I'm always like, OK, so you pay money for somebody to help you and to guide you and all of that. And you invest in your hobby. But in the thing that puts bread on your table, you don't invest at all. I mean, so weigh that one out. Yeah, that's an interview question I ask every candidate. The first question I ask them is, what sort of professional sales training have you been provided by the company? The mm -hmm. most common answer is none, by the way, mm -hmm. which gets which leads me to question number two. So what are you doing for your own personal and professional development? And what kind of answers do you normally get to that? I don't get a lot of good answers from that one. Um, I do get, I get, I, I think more people than ever are listening to podcasts. Yes. So I do get that they're listening to podcasts. They have some, you know, I ask them about influencers that they follow. Um, it's interesting. They're very rarely on YouTube. Um, they don't often mention uh, even like a lot of people on LinkedIn or reading a lot of LinkedIn type articles. Um, I think it catches, uh, honestly, I think it catches people off guard. I yeah. think they're not, I think they don't see that as their responsibility. I think they see it, like you said, as the company's responsibility, but like no one will ever, like you said, no one will ever care as much about you, your career, your advancement, how much money you're going to make than you. Mm -hmm. And so why would we be abdicate? I, I, I equate it to this. I say, particularly in SaaS, we are always in, like as, a, as sales professionals, we are in complete control over the first two steps in the process, right? Discovery and demo. Mm -hmm. And then I say we abdicate the remaining pieces of the sales process or sales cycle to the prospect, which is why mm -hmm. it takes so long to close deals, is why deals fall off, is we don't know how to keep control of the sales cycle once we've done the demo and they say, oh, we're going to go off and need to talk amongst ourselves and then we'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And literally, you've just handed your baby over to someone else to raise. Right. Yeah. You told you told you're just like, okay, well, like make sure they have three meals a day and they have, you know, they, their favorite, you know, here's their favorite toy. And you just totally hand your baby over to somebody who's not qualified to raise it. Yeah. And then we do the same, we're doing the same thing with our own careers. We're handing our baby over to someone who will not love it as much as we love it, who will not take care of it the way that we would take care of it. And, and then we wonder, you know, when we get into our forties and fifties, like what, where did the time go and how come yeah. I'm not as successful as so-and-so? Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I agree completely. I always call that kind of like out, outsourcing your future to fate. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not a good strategy. <laughs> not, not a, not a good strategy. So, I mean, I think it's a, a great message this morning, Christy is like, you know, be intentional, like be, be self-aware, like go on that self-awareness journey. It's not an easy one. And sometimes no. you have to. You know, it's it's the hardest thing is to admit things to yourself uh, and uh, what you're suited for. But also, as you said, is like go and figure out what is your ideal 
company to work for? What is the ideal thing to sell? What is the ideal sales role for you? And be creative in that don't box yourself in thinking that sales management is the only career path. Yes, it's not. And and again, people are messy. It's actually not even that much fun sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like, I, I, it may look glamorous from the outside, but people are very messy. And all they are. Really I always, that was always my that was always my favorite when I you know, when I'd be talking to people and be asking them, and they'd say, "Oh, yeah, I want to manage people and be a team leader." I'd go, "Why?" <laughs> and they'd be, "What do you mean?" I say, "Why do you want to manage people? Right. What's your concept of managing people?" Because I'll give you mine. <laughs> I was in your part therapist, part parent, your part teacher, your part disciplinarian, yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah. and your part. Our, <laughs> I agree. I agree. You and I, you and I must have had the same management leadership experience. Exactly. <laughs> well, listen, thanks, Christy. All of Christy's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so I exclusively work with early stage, mostly VC backed startups, although some privately owned. So I say I I uh, definitely uh, my expertise is in the zero to five million dollar in revenue space. So I do three things for my clients. I help them build out and formalize and document all of their sales processes. I then help them connect that to customizing the CRM system. So everything's tied together. Then the second thing I do, I kind of mentioned um, I am not a recruiter or a staffing company and I don't source but I project manage the hiring process. I handhold them through the entire thing. I lead the interviews. I make the offers and I stick around to make sure they don't screw up the onboarding as well. Because if I'm, because that's the piece that doesn't, doesn't always get done well either. Yeah. Um, and then I do some, some interim sales leadership. So um, I'm getting ready to start an opportunity here pretty soon. They lost their sales leader. So I'm coming in to keep the boat afloat, if you will, while we um, hire and onboard a new sales leader for them. So I do that from time to time. Um, and helping people out when they get stuck in some situations. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I would encourage you to go check it out. Go check the book, Selling Your Way In, yes. and check out all the other services. So listen, thanks again, Christy. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you, John.